Hey, third graders, it's Mrs. Linderman. We're going to continue with the year of Miss Agnes today, and we're going to read a couple of chapters. And one thing that we're going to focus on today is how words and phrases can have both literal meanings and non-literal meanings. So that just means if I were going to like look in a dictionary to look up a word, that's called like the literal meaning of a word, what the words really are saying. But a non-literal meaning is different. It's like their meaning behind the words. So for example, someone says something is uh, a piece of cake, right? It's not actually a piece of cake. It means that it's easy. So there's a meaning behind that. So we're going to read a couple chapters of the Year of Miss Agnes today. And then your activity today is going to be matching some of those literal meanings to the non-literal meanings. So we're going to start on chapter five today. After we looked at all the books and stuff, Miss Agnes told us all to sit down. Little Pete and Roger pretended like they were going to sit in the same chair by Marie and they pushed each other and wrestled. I waited for the teacher to holler at them and hit her desk with the ruler, but she just looked at them with her eyebrow up and her mouth a little pushed to one side. It wasn't a mean look. It was a smart look, if you know what I mean. So she, so they stopped and sat down. It was no fun trying to get this teacher upset because it didn't look like she could be upset. Miss Agnes was different in some way. She told us to take all our old books out and put them on the desk. There were geography books and history books and reading books and penmanship books you made little circles in. They were pretty beat up. They weren't even new when we first got our school, just hand-me-downs from other schools that didn't need them. She had us put all those books away in cardboard boxes and she told little Pete and Roger that after school, they'd have to put them in the cache where we stored everything we didn't need. She even put the ugly old grade book in the boxes. I don't believe in grades, she said. Boy, that was good news. We sure never started school throwing books out before. We didn't know what to think. Then the teacher put a big box on the long table and we gathered around to watch while she unwrapped it. When she opened the box, it smelled so good, like new pencils. And that was because there were pencils in it. Not just the yellow kind we always had, but boxes and boxes of colored pencils with every color of lead you could think of. And there were big yellow boxes of crayons, 48 in a box, the skinny kind, not the fat kind we had before. And a box of green pencils with dark lead and lots and lots of tin boxes of paints. Each one had a little brush in it and there was another bunch of little brushes tied together with a rubber band. And there was a wooden box with a little metal tube that Miss Agnes said had paint in them too. I couldn't believe she was going to let us use all those beautiful things. But Miss Agnes started to lay the things out on the long table. And then she brought out paper from another box, medium sized paper and some big paper, bigger than we ever saw before. The first thing you must do, she said, is to brighten up the school. Everyone will make a picture for the wall. Let's look at that sentence. The first thing you must do is to brighten up the school. If I look the word brighten up in a dictionary, that means to make something lighter, right? What do you think she means about brightening up the school? Miss Agnes showed us how to rule a margin for a picture so there would be a white space all around. That was for a frame. She told us we could use the big paper or the little paper, and we could make a picture of anything we liked, but we had to fill in all the white space inside the frame with color. Miss Agnes said that was the difference between a fine painting and a drawing. She showed us how to wipe our brushes carefully while we were painting, and then she helped the littlest ones, Selena and Charlie Boy. They took the big boxes of crayons and made a dark line with every single crayon. They held the crayons so hard, their fingers turned white. They wanted to know the names of every color. They had funny names. 
not like the plain names on our old fat crayons. We laughed and laughed when Miss Agnes said the names. Burnt Sienna and Magenta and Periwinkle. Flesh, that was very funny. We all put that flesh crayon by our hands and laughed because our skin and that crayon weren't anything like the, the same color. Even when we put it by Miss Agnes's hand, it wasn't the same color. We didn't know who would have skin that color. So think about what they're doing in their classroom. How is that an example of them brightening the school up? They're decorating, right? They're making it not look drab and kind of plain and boring. They're giving it some color and trying to make it look a little bit more interesting. Miss Agnes sort of snorted and said, no one. Pretty soon, everyone got just quiet. We were so happy making our pictures. Miss Agnes put a record on the record player. It was singing. Only the voices were really high and sliding around like. Once I heard the same kind of music in Koyakuk. Dominic Carlotti, who owned the store there, played it on his record player. Only Dominic's was scratchier than Miss Agnes's record, so it seemed old. This seemed new and bright in some different language. The sunshine was filling the room from those bright windows. Oh my goodness, look at that. They're brightening the room. Here's the sound that's bright. Think about what that would be like, a bright sound. And now there's actual bright light from the sunshine. The sunshine was filling the room from those bright windows and that music was going up, up in some kind of way. I felt excited inside, like when the stern wheel is coming up the river for the first time after the ice breaks up. Dominic has that kind of music, I told her. Yes, he does, she said. Dominic likes opera. It's the favorite kind of music where he comes from. He's Italian, she said. I looked at the big map. She walked to it and said, here, this one that looks like a boot. That's where Dominic comes from. I had never thought of people coming from anywhere before. And now I knew two new places, English and the boot. When all those pictures were on the wall, we couldn't stop looking at them. Every place we looked was some bright color. Little Pete made a picture of his dad's trap line cabin out by Nicoli Slaw. It was so good with a blue sky and these good little snowshoes he drew with a pen. The teacher gave him that you dip in black ink. He was proud of that picture. I could tell because he kept making fun of it. And Selena made one of her baby sister in the new boots her mom made for her. That picture was funny because the baby was real small, but the boots took up nearly the whole page. Roger made a good picture of Sam White's airplane. And he asked Miss Agnes how to spell Gullwing Stinson so he could write that at the bottom. Roger really liked airplanes and he knew all the different names they had and all about the engines and stuff. Kenny did the stern wheeler, George Black's idler. That comes up the Koyakuk River every year with all our freight. It's hard to draw it right because there are a hundred paddles on the wheel that pushes the boat, but Kenny did it good. I wanted to make a picture of the music she was playing, but I didn't know how, so I made a picture of Miss Agnes. It was hard to get her hair, some gray and some not gray, all flying around her head somehow, not pulled neat like Mama's or the other women. When it was time for lunch, I felt a little worried. The other kids did too, I could tell. Plasker, most of all. I wonder, do you know why they're worried? You're about to eat lunch. Think about that. Miss Agnes had made some tea from the pot on the stove. And she told us if we all brought cups from home tomorrow, we could have some too. She must have made a batch of bread after Bertha and I left her that the day before because she had a sandwich to eat with her tea, peanut butter. We got really quiet while we were eating. All the kids had their heads down, looking at their desks. 
Miss Agnes looked at us a little strangely. Finally, I asked her, Do you like fish, Miss Agnes? It was very quiet. I wonder why it was quiet. All the kids looked at her from under their eyebrows to see what she'd say. No, she made a face. I hate fish. That was bad. I tried to cover my fish strips with my hand. Miss Agnes looked at all of us with a question on her face. Our old teacher didn't like the smell of fish, I said. Oh, Miss Agnes said. Well, I can't smell anything. I have sinus trouble. We all looked at each other. So that was good. So they were worried, right? They had schema, prior knowledge about their old teacher, right? When they ate lunch and pulled out their fish, she didn't like that, right? And she didn't make them feel very welcome. So they were very worried when it was time to eat lunch because they didn't know how Miss Agnes would react. Turns out it wasn't a problem at all, right? She couldn't even smell it. Let's continue with chapter six. After lunch that first day, Miss Agnes said she needed to find out how much writing we had learned. I was not happy to do this because I hadn't learned much. She gave us new pencils and paper with lines and told us all to write our names and the day we were born. The older ones were to write something about themselves, just anything to show Miss Agnes what we could do. We all looked at Bertha because Bertha was so good at writing. It seemed like she was writing all the time. Even before we went to school, she used to get a pencil from old man Anderson and she'd hunker down by the boxes in the store and she'd copy the writing. She'd write Olympia beer and Pillsbury flour and anything that was printed on the boxes. She didn't know what the letters said. She just thought they were pretty. Old man Anderson wrote the alphabet the way it goes on a piece of paper for her. Bertha, you'll be my secretary when you grow up, he told her. She never let loose of that piece of paper. It was always in her pocket. She'd copy the letters in the snow with a stick or in the mud on the riverbank. Bertha was funny that way. Miss Agnes stopped in surprise when she saw Bertha's writing. Well, Bertha, she bent to look carefully at each letter. It would be hard to improve on that, she said. Bertha looked really shining, like having Miss Agnes see what a good writer she was. I'll teach you how to write cursive now. You're ready. I knew what that was, that curly kind of writing. Some grown-ups used just flying across the paper, 90 miles an hour. I couldn't wait to learn that too. Marie looked like she was going to cry. She was 14, but she'd only spent a few months in school on and off. Her mom had all those babies Marie had to take care of when her mom went to help dad on the trap line. She couldn't write much at all. She put her head down. Miss Agnes walked around and looked at everyone's writing. Charlie Boy and Selena could write their names, but that was all. None of us were very good at writing, except Bertha. Miss Agnes took a roll of masking tape from her shelf and put a strip on each desk. She wrote the alphabet in printing on that strip with a pen. She wrote the big letters and then the little letters. Then she taped a paper on our desk with our name written in perfect letters. That was to help us remember. For Bertha, she wrote the letters in cursive. Then she started to show the rest of us on the blackboard what each letter was supposed to look like, starting with the vowels, because she said you use one of those in every word. So the vowels had to be really good. Like if on a shopping list you wrote an O so it looked like an E, you might get a pet instead of a pot. She made it funny, showing us how awful letters looked when they were made silly. Miss Agnes called a sloppy O a hairy O because when you don't write an O right, it looks like a little face with one hair sticking up on top. We really laughed at that. And she said the nose of an E was supposed to be sharp enough to prick your finger on. Then she drew a finger getting pricked by that sharp point on the E. I'm noticing she's really taking an interest in them. She's trying really hard. 
I don't think they've ever had a teacher like Miss Agnes before. We never tried to do it right before. We just wrote any which way. So we were surprised to find Miss Agnes was going to be so picky. She said if we wrote our letters sloppy, she would give us back our work and make us do it over. Mm, that sounds like teachers I know. You'd think it would make me mad to do that, but it made me glad. Like when my grandma makes me do something over and over till I get it right, I feel like she's going to make sure I learn it good. And so I don't feel mad. That's how I feel now. Or that's how I felt now. We practice on our paper, making sharp nosed E's and perfect O's that weren't hairy and straight eyes with the dot right smack on top, not drifting away somewhere. Charlie boy made us laugh because he was practicing so hard, his tongue was sticking out. It was fun the way we did it. And I wanted to make every letter just perfect. I could write as perfect as Miss Agnes and Bertha if I just practiced. While we practiced our printing, Miss Agnes read to us for half an hour, walking up and down in front of the windows while the snowflakes came tumbling down, that kind that's real big and slow falling. It was a story called Robin Hood, about a man who stole money from the rich people and gave the money to the poor people who needed it. It was an olden time story from when people had bows and arrows. When Miss Agnes read to us, she did all the people in different voices and we forgot right away it was just reading. It got real like being inside the book. I didn't want Miss Agnes to ever stop reading. I felt as if I really was in that dark, deep forest with trees taller than you ever heard of. And when she stopped, I felt shocked as if I'd come out of a dream. The boys were all excited to think of people fighting with big fat sticks like that. Like when Robin Hood and Little John were on the bridge. We don't have any big sticks around here, just spruce poles. And we all thought it was funny because the book had a Little John and we had a little Pete, and they were both really big, not little. When she put the book back on her desk, Miss Agnes took one of the big pieces of paper and made a picture of Robin Hood. She could draw really good and fast too. Zip, 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 and there was a man. We all laughed when she made him have long underwear with funny moccasins that had pointed toes and a short shirt and a hat like Gilbert Dendoff was wearing when he came home from the army, except Robin Hood's hat had a feather in it. Then she took a box of colored chalk and colored him in. Green clothes, because that was like the merry men's uniform. And that was Robin Hood. Marie wanted a picture of Maid Marian. Marie was all worried that Robin wouldn't see his girlfriend again because he was an outlaw. But Miss Agnes wouldn't tell us any of the story ahead of time, not even a hint.